So friends, uh, welcome to the 94th session of Legal Empowerment through Interaction Lecture Series. The journey has been wonderful. We had eminent speakers. Many among the speak uh, eminent persons are in the panel today. We have yet another eminent speaker. This is Somay Azulu from Andhra Pradesh High School. One thing I would like to disclose to those who don't know him is that uh, he was practicing at Vaishakhapatnam, Vishakhapatnam, and from directly from the Mufusil Bar, he was elevated as a judge of uh, High, Court, uh, High Court of Andhra Pradesh. It is something really great, and uh, we look forward for a wonderful interaction today. We recognize the presence of Justice V. Ram Kumar, Justice Murthy Sir, Justice Ramakrishnan Sir, and all of you wonderful participants today. Let us have an insightful uh, presentation from. Uh, uh, Justice Omaya Jalu on civil remedies available to um, malicious arrest, prosecution, and the police excesses. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Shah. Good afternoon, Justice Ram Kumar. Justice Good afternoon. afternoon. All the respected judges and colleagues from the bar who are here. And I will start with a little caveat, if you don't mind. As uh, uh, Mr. Shah has said, I am from the trial court. And I have been elevated to the High Court, and this is the first time I think I'm addressing an audience that is uh, oh, so no big. So, in case I make any mistakes, I do hope you will uh, treat them benevolently and forgive me. Be perfectly case, at home. At home. In case I don't make any mistakes, uh, the horseshoe on which I'm sitting and my prayers have been answered. <laughs> so, definitely. I'll try my level best to go ahead and do what is uh, assigned to me. I mean, the topic that was chosen is a topic that's very, very apt, very, very current, and very, very, if I may use the word topical for today. All of you are in the active practice, so I need not go into the depth of the introduction. Most of you are aware what happened in Minnesota when a police officer put a, put a leg on the neck of a person. The only kind he was accused of was giving a fake $20 bill in a showroom. So the question that has come to come up to everybody's mind and the violence that followed was on the issue. Was such force necessary to detain a man for such a trivial crime? Then we had the incidents in Tutikoran, where a father and son. And what was their offense that day? They kept their shop open beyond the regular working <laughs> in the COVID period. You have a case in Andhra Pradesh where a youngster was wearing a was not wearing a mask. Nothing more, nothing less. He was not wearing a mask. The police took him into custody and the allegations are that third degree methods were used and the boy died. These were three recent incidents that are on top of everybody's minds coming to the topic. Apart from that, we have that issue in uh, UP, Vivek Dubey's arrest encounter. encounter. Prior to that, we had that issue in Telangana and Andhra Pradesh where a young lady veterinarian doctor was raped and four people said to have been the rapists were killed in an encounter when they were trying to escape. So therefore, this is a topic that has been worrying everybody, all the right thinking individuals of the society, worrying the lawyers, the jurists, the judges, everybody across. The in fact, at least not in India, America for the first time witnessed large scale violence across the country where the Black Lives Matter also, that movement also gathered momentum because of this. Therefore, this is a topic which, in my opinion, is very, very topical, very, very correct, and very apt for the day. I do hope that I will be able to do justice. When it comes to the civil remedies per se, they are very, very limited. I don't want to go to the conclusion right now. But if you look at the civil remedies that arise, arise for malicious prosecution or for police arrests or for excessive use of force or what is generally termed as in civil law rather as vexatious proceedings, there are two provisions in the CPC that I'd like to briefly touch upon before going into the rest of it. Now, malicious prosecution of these three, in my opinion, is the smaller of the two topics. So with the permission of the floor, I'd like to touch upon malicious prosecution first and then move slowly to the other two topics. My background as a civil lawyer, a trial court lawyer also makes it more comfortable to get me into the group. Now, if you look at the two provisions in the CPC that I'm talking about, 
you'll have to look at section 95 of the CPC first. Section 95, you know, malicious prosecution before that, as you know, is a prosecution which is not grounded on fact, grounded on a belief that the person initiating the prosecution knows that it is not a, a good case. It's a vexatious or a mischievous case that he's initiating with an ulterior motive and malice in mind. Therefore, one of the first sections that I would like to draw the attention of the audience is section 95, which talks about compensation for obtaining arrest, attachment, injunction on insufficient grounds. Wherein a suit in which an attachment or arrest has been effected or a temporary injunction granted under the preceding section, that is section 94, which deals with supplemental provisions, it appears to the court that such arrest, attachment or injunction was applied for on insufficient grounds or the suit of the plaintiff fails and it appears to the court that there was no reasonable or probable ground for initiating, instituting the same. The defendant may apply to the court and the court may upon such application award against the plaintiff by its order such amount not exceeding 50,000 rupees. It was 1,000 rupees amended in 2002 to 50,000 rupees as a reasonable compensation to the defendant for the expense or injury, including an injury to reputation. If it appears to the court that the injunction or attachment or arrest was obtained without there being sufficient grounds or reasonable or probable grounds, the court may, on such an application, award the costs, provided etc. But what is important is sub clause 2, which says an order determining any such application shall bar any suit for compensation in respect of such arrest, attachment, or injunction. The reason why I'm prefacing my talk today on the basis of this section 95, as you all are aware, malicious prosecution, in fact, the malicious prosecution may not be the appropriate malicious initiation of proceedings. The remedy essentially is a civil remedy for damages. Both punitive and normal damages are what are normal. So if you look at section 95, it gives you a slight guiding factor. If the suit of the plaintiff fails and it appears to the court that there was no reasonable or probable grounds for it, unfortunately, the maximum damages that can be granted or costs that can be granted are only 50,000 rupees. Prior to 2002, there were only 1,000 rupees. Now it has been increased to 50,000 rupees. Now, this section fell for consideration in the judgment of the Honorable Supreme Court of India reported for in 2000, Volume 3, SCC 640. The audience may kindly bear with me. I would like to give more case law and set the thinking into motion rather than just give my opinion on the subject. I have seen some of the interactions over the last few days when I joined the webinars and I realized that there are a lot of learned people and a lot of interesting questions. Questions with a lot of substance are coming up. In fact, when I asked Mr. Sham, should I wear a suit or a jacket? He said, sir, the content is more important rather than your dress. Exactly. Just of what he has said. I will be trying to give some case law that I've managed to pick up in the last few days, hoping that it would kindle your thoughts and set a dialogue in motion. The malicious legal process, the judgment that has received the consideration, the, the judgment that I'm relying upon is 2000, Volume 3, Supreme Court Cases, page 640. Bank of India versus Lekhimani Das. Now, in this case, the Supreme Court distinguished, I mean, all of you know, when there are two remedies open, that is a remedy under 95 for seeking cost or a remedy of a civil suit, the Supreme Court said that you can choose one of the two. But once you opt for a remedy and that remedy results in an order, then you are precluded from, I mean, this is settled law, it does not require a lot of repetition. So therefore, the Supreme Court said, as a general principle, when two remedies are available under law, one of them should not be taken as operating in derogation of the other. However, if a party has elected to pursue one remedy, he is bound by it and cannot, on his failing, proceed under the other provision. Therefore, if the application under Section 95 is initiated, per malicious prosecution, 
and an order has been invited from a court of competent jurisdiction that will preclude you from taking any other action under the civil law in this case also the supreme court had an occasion to consider the essential ingredients that are necessary in a suit for a malicious prosecution or the remedy for malicious in paragraph 9 the honorable supreme court has said if the plaintiff is bringing a suit for a malicious prosecution proof of malice is necessary the plaintiff must also prove special damages so part if a person is not a party to the proceeding kindly note that subtle distinction that the honorable supreme court if a person is not a party to the proceeding and there is a wrongful attachment injunction or arrest he will simply have to file an action for trespass in case he files an action for trespass and claims the result in damages he just has to prove that somebody has come in somebody has touched him on his person or came into his property and attempted to attach it the rack the reason for the attachment or the rationale or the justification is for the defendant therefore if a party to a proceeding is suffering from an order he will have to prove the absence of a probable reasonable cause and that there is malice in the claim this is the judgment in which section 95 was considered the other section that i wish to draw your kind attention to is section 35a cpc which as you all know deals with what are known as exemplary costs section 35a starts with the heading compensatory costs in respect of false or vexatious claims or defenses false or vexatious claims or defenses now this is the essence of an action of malicious prosecution the claim is per se false yet the person pursues it with the malice in mind with an intention to cause some harm to the defendant that is why section 35a would also come into play but unfortunately those of you who have read the law would know that in the salem advocates bar association case the honorable supreme court of india was dealing with an issue of awarding realistic and actual costs in that case the honorable supreme court of india wanted a regime of costs to come in wherein the costs that would be imposed would be realistic and would often be very accurate that means the actual cost that would be awarded and in the west one of the reasons why people are afraid of frivolous or malicious prosecutions is because of the costs which are prohibitive and which would act as a very visible deterrent from prosecuting false claims unfortunately in india we do not have such a cost regime 35a talks of compensatory costs but unfortunately 35a clause 2 which gives the power to the court to levy costs where the proceedings are false vexatious etc sets an upper limit of 3000 rupees <laughs> as we all know in fact jasura kumar is smiling away 3000 rupees is hardly a deterrent for anybody particularly a rich man okay. therefore this doesn't in a real but one good silver lining that i could find is when the commercial court act has come this part of the this limit of 3000 rupees has been taken away therefore as far as commercial courts are concerned there is a chance that if there is a frivolous litigation if there is a malicious prosecution there is a very very good likelihood of actual costs being imposed now if actual costs are imposed i think this would work as a deterrent unfortunately in the supreme in the uh, salem bar advocates association case the supreme court merely suggested that realistic costs should be imposed and we should bring in legislation legislation to impose realistic costs people should think twice before initiating a prosecution which they know in their heart of hearts is malicious because one of the essential ingredients in a malicious prosecution is that the plaintiff is commencing the prosecution or the proceeding with malice in his mind and without a reasonable cause so he knows in his heart of hearts that he is initiating a proceeding which is not really relief oriented or true therefore i feel that there should be 
there should be a deterrent as a proper relief unfortunately that is not there this section fell for consideration in a case before the supreme court of india in sanjeev kumar jain mm. versus raghubir saran charitable trust sanjeev kumar jain versus raghubir saran charitable trust 2012 1 scc page 455 there a learned judge this happened in delhi a learned judge asked the parties to file their costs memo and approximately 45 lakhs of costs were certified and filed and the learned judge awarded those costs the question before the honorable supreme court was is there a justification for awarding such costs the honorable supreme court went into the provisions of 35a considered the judgment of the supreme court in the salem advocates association case and said what was suggested in salem advocates association by the honorable supreme court was the need for a relief therefore the entire costs were struck down now the example that the honorable supreme court gave is very interesting he says suppose there is a money suit for recovery of 1 lakh only suppose he gets the plaintiff who wants to make a very strong and forceful case gets a senior advocate who charges 1 lakh per appearance 30 adjournments are taken so realistic costs would mean 30 lakhs of costs in a suit the value of which is only 1 lakh therefore the honorable supreme court said that realistic cost does not mean actual costs and the limits that are prescribed as the law stands should still be there to these were the two civil remedies that i could find for a malicious initiate civil prosecution only as i said earlier the term should be rephrased as a malicious proceeding rather than a malicious prosecution but i think by the passage of time we are beginning to use it as analysis prosecution without noting in fact in one of the comments i have been seeing that somebody said arrest is only a civil arrest that is the reason why that i am prompted to say this is malicious proceedings rather than malicious prosecution time and again various courts of the land have said that both for initiation of malicious criminal prosecution and for initiation of malicious civil proceedings the remedy is the same no coming to a malicious civil malicious proceeding instead of distinguishing distinguishing it as civil and criminal you all know that the essence of a malicious civil proceeding malicious proceeding are that we are talking of two proceedings here there is a proceeding that has been initiated which has turned out to be malicious because the current plaintiff has been subjected to a malicious proceeding He is initiating another proceeding for damages. Therefore, the first proceeding is the crux. There should be a proceeding against the current plaintiff. That proceeding should touch upon the plaintiff's character, honor, or property. Three, the proceeding should end in favor. i mean if a man is convicted it, it can't be called a malicious proceeding if a decree is passed against him it can't be called a malicious proceeding only when the proceeding is found to be false and it goes against the first plaintiff that the defendant in that case becomes the plaintiff in the second suit and gets an option for initiating the proceeding let me call it a and b maybe it will become easier a initiates a proceeding against b that proceeding should be and touching upon the character the property the assets etc of b the proceeding file a should be dismissed by the court and the proceeding started by a should be initiated with malice and he should know in his heart of hearts that this proceeding is not a genuine proceeding meant to redress a genuine wrong that is when the proceeding becomes malicious vexatious or false therefore with an intention to cause some damage 
with that intention in mind the person proceeds against the other whether he initiates it by giving a report to the police whether he initiates it by filing a plaint or a case in a civil court he should initiate the proceeding with some amount of malice in mind knowing deep down that this is not a genuine proceeding for it now i will draw your honors everybody's attention to one very lovely judgment of the madras high court reported in aar 1957 madras 646 you must all pardon me when we choose judgments there be some amount of subjective element here i have chosen judgments which i felt are correct they describe the law the evolution of the law as i said at the very outset the idea is to set the thinking in motion with the hope that all of you would read them later if a need arises to prosecute or to defend such a case or if the need arises just to think on these lines therefore i have chosen cases where there is something which i feel is useful to set the thinking in 57 madras 646 aar 1957 madras 646 this is a wonderful judgment of justice ramaswamy of the madras high court of 1957 wherein the entire growth of law starting from the english tort law the common law etc was in, that is evolved was looked into by a lordship before a conclusion was arrived this is one of the best judgments that i have chanced upon and studied in the recent past the doubt that any of us had that a prosecution would only talk of a criminal prosecution and not a civil prosecution civil proceeding is also set at rest the five elements that i talked of earlier are already described then with lordship said the prosecution normally means criminal proceedings in general the purpose of tort of malicious prosecution it includes all criminal proceeding the word prosecution in the phrase criminal malicious prosecution <laughs> is not to be taken in its restricted sense in which it is used in the crpc therefore it is clarified that it is both a civil and a criminal proceeding which can be brought within the ambit of malicious prosecution in order to entitle a plaintiff to succeed in a suit for damages for malicious prosecution the first essential element is that there was a prosecution or a case now the question is who is a prosecutor or who prosecutes a case a prosecutor has been described as a man who actively takes a role or is instrumental in putting the law in motion <coughs> it is not merely enough if he gives a report to the police and the police take the subsequent action he should be a person who has now we are dealing with a specific class of cases called malicious prosecution these are the ingredients in it he should be an actively a party who is actively pursuing the case what is lordship has said that there should be some affirmative action in connection with the prosecution this must be which must be shown therefore a person who actively pursues the case and not merely sits back after giving a complaint or a report to the police can be said to be a A prosecutor in this case then the other question that would arise here is if he takes a legal advice and basing on his lawyer's sound legal advice he prosecutes the case can he be said to have launched a prosecution which is malicious after considering the case law on the subject the lordship came to the conclusion that a person who relies on his counsel sound legal advice and pursues the litigation cannot be held to be guilty of malicious proceed there is a reason why i am drawing this because at the end of the session we should all come to a conclusion whether the remedies that are available are really useful or not particularly the civil remedies there is a purpose behind going into this in a little detail we will have to ultimately come to a conclusion i have come to a conclusion i would also like your collective wisdom to come to a, whether there are effective remedies or not that should be the end according to me so here also a person who takes legal advice of his counsel and proceeds further cannot be said to be a person who has actively pursued the litigation then the litigation should not be without a reasonable or a probable cause 
the litigation should not be with a reasonable, <laughs> reasonable or probable cause. It is only when the plaintiff points out that the litigation doesn't have a reasonable cause that he will succeed in malicious prosecution. The prosecution will be termed malicious when the plaintiff is able to prove to the court that there is no justifiable cause for the litigation. Then the burden would shift on the defendant to show that the action taken by him is correct in law. There should be the prosecution or the proceeding should end in a dismissal or an acquittal, whatever it is called. It is only then that a plaintiff or a party would succeed. So all these clauses should be proved. All these conditions should exist. There should be a proceeding, a proceeding which is vexatious, not founded on fact or law, a proceeding which is actively pursued, a proceeding which causes damage or loss, and a proceeding which ended in an acquittal or a dismissal. Then the defendant in the first case can come up before this court and now say, I was subjected to malicious prosecution, as a result of which I sustained damages. There are two types of damages that all, you, all of us are aware. Damages to the person, damages in defending a case, etc., which are the real damages. And the non-pecuniary damages, which are loss of reputation, etc., which again is a matter of evidence. Therefore, if all these five elements are present, of which crucial are the psychological and the mental element, the absence of a reasonable cause and malice in the mind of the original prosecutor, then only a case for malicious prosecution would lie. These two elements must necessarily be established. The mental state of the original plaintiff it is a matter which the plaintiff in the second suit is called upon to establish. That is one of the difficulties in this branch of law. It is not enough to show that he filed a case and it is dismissed. It is necessary that the plaintiff to succeed in a case for malicious prosecution should prove that the original plaintiff who sued him A did not have a probable cause and he had a ulterior motive in his mind. These are the essential elements in a case for malicious prosecution. And all of you, I would humbly request all of you to read this judgment at length. Beautifully written judgment, virtually considering all possible defenses and permutations and combinations that would arise in a case of this nature. Very, very learned judge, very, very lovely judgment. This judgment of 1957 is, in my opinion, one of the best judgments that I chanced upon. Then there is also 2014, one Andhra Law Decisions, Andhra ALD, page 16. 2014, one ALD, page 16. This is a division bench judgment of the AP High Court. The reason why I'm drawing your attention at this stage to this judgment is because of the counsels who may be called upon the need for adequate pleading to describe these elements is considered in this judgment. This is Wipro Products versus Akbar Nuri. Wipro Products versus Akbar Nuri, 2014, 1 ALD, page 16. Is there any com comparative citation, AAR or ILR? Suit I can give you, sir. 2013 lawsuit, 2013 lawsuit, Andhra Pradesh, page 825, 2014, volume 1, civil, CC 180, these are the three equivalents, sir. Wipro Products Limited versus Akbar Nuri, but just as Ramkumar said, the limited purpose for which I am relying on is the need for counsels for the adequacy of the pleading. Here also they considered the essential ingredients. It is only in a, in a suit, when a plaintiff in such a suit pleads and proves that the very submission of the complaint step by the defendant in the present suit was motivated and was done with a malicious intention that the occasion for the civil court to award damages would arise. Two facts become relevant. The first is 
if there is an indication in the judgment of the criminal court that the complaint itself was false and the accused was subjected to unnecessary prosecution, the burden for such an accused to prove malice in the suit filed by him gets lightened to an extent. The second is that the plaintiff must at least mention the facts which according to him constitute the basis for initiation of false and malicious prosecution. Though motive is not required to be proved in case of a tort, the basic facts which leave an impression in the plaintiff must be stated with clarity. This is the precaution that you should keep in mind when you are called upon to draft a plea. Normally, people loosely use the word you subjected me to malicious prosecution, therefore I am claiming damages. In my opinion, that by itself will not suffice. There has to be something more. The mere fact that a case ended in an acquittal or a dismissal, the first case, is again not enough. Cases can end in, end in acquittals or dismissals for various reasons. You should be able to demonstrate in your suit for malicious prosecution that the initial action was motivated with malice, with an intention in mind to cause harm. For that, the foundational facts should be laid in the plane. This is something that you should be very, very careful about. Then the question would be, I'll just go through the case law and come back. Question would be, in a case of this nature, should only regular damages be awarded or can exemplary damages be also awarded? So the normal damages that a person would seek in a case of this nature are damages in actual expenses for deciding the, for defending the case, the expenses incurred in court by him. If there is a wrongful attachment, any expense he was called to bear in the period that the order was lifted. And normally a damage to the reputation. A false arrest for that matter. For a leading businessman or a professional. An arrest from a court of law which later turns out to be false, can be very, very damaging in terms of reputation. In 1946, Madras, page 147, Lala Punnalal versus Kasturi Chand Ramaji. 1946, Madras, page 147 itself, it was clearly held that exemplary damages can also be awarded and it is not necessary that the court should be niggardly or circumspect in awarding damages. They have taken 1931 Madras itself as a case where it was found that exemplary damages were awarded and that learned judge said there is nothing in law which prohibits the award of damages. Now, exemplary. Also for your consideration is the judgment of Justice Sujata Manohar when she was in the Bombay High Court. In A.R. 1981, Bombay, page 170. In this case also, Justice Sujata Manohar, as she then was, dealt with a case, an abuse of civil proceedings. So those of you who still have a little doubt at the back of your head, whether it applies to civil proceedings, this judgment should set at rest. Any doubts that you have. Division bench of the Bombay High Court, AAR 1981, Bombay, page 170. All the ingredients that are necessary for proving a case of malicious abuse of civil proceedings was dealt with by Her Lordship. All the ingredients that I have, met, that I have said or talked about so far have been discussed. And then, ultimately on merits, that is a different issue. Lordship did not find a case was made out. But... The ingredients necessary to be pleaded and proved are set out succinctly in this judgment. Now, the reason why I drew these, your attention to these is the first is the case of the essential ingredients. Next is the case of the pleading that is necessary. Third is a case where exemplary damages were awarded and continue to be awarded. Fourth again is a case where in a civil proceeding, which is malicious in nature, damages were also awarded. These are the broad outlines that I'm giving. Apart from all of this, I would also draw your honors. Your, sorry, that is a, the advocate in me has still not taken a back seat. So I still keep saying your honor occasionally. <laughs> but the, apart from that, there's one interesting thing <coughs> West Bengal, Dilip Kumar, West Bengal State Electricity Board versus Dilip Kumar Ray. 
2007-14 Supreme Court cases 568. 2007-14 Supreme Court cases page 568. This was a case of a person who was exposed to continuous departmental inquiries while he was working in the State Electricity Board. Series of departmental inquiries were initiated against him and he was constantly pursued according to him because of the animosity of a few senior officers. In the division bench in the Calcutta High Court, he succeeded. And the division bench of the Calcutta High Court held that the proceedings were malicious, therefore he is entitled to damages. Matter was taken up to the Supreme Court and this is one of the few cases that I found where the Honorable Supreme Court dealt with malicious prosecutions. Here also, on merits, they came to a conclusion that the case was not made up and dismissed the case because adequate reading was not there. Therefore, councils who are drafting cases should be very, very careful in this paragraph 22. A bare perusal of the averments made in the plate <coughs> show that they are extremely vague, lacking in details. And after the learned trial judge held that the board alone was responsible because it was not established that any individual officer was responsible for it. The High Court's judgment suffers from infirmities. It takes a confused who? You. It failed to notice that the trial court itself has said it is highly probable that the plaintiff was suspended for extraneous reasons. On merits, Seeing the lack of adequate pleadings and the manner in which the judgment was done, the Honorable Supreme Court said the case is not made out. But if those of you who are interested in a very, very lengthy discussion of what exactly is a malicious prosecution, the Lordship Justice Ajit Pasayat has set out a number of definitions on what exactly constitutes a malicious prosecution. Definitions of various leading textbooks, dictionaries, etc. were all reproduced. And the two essential elements, according to the Lordship, were that in a malicious prosecution, the two essential elements are there is no probable cause for instituting of the prosecution or the suit complained of, and that such prosecution or suit terminated in a way in favor. So these are the two essential ingredients. Therefore, even before the Honorable Supreme Court of India, the distinction or the apparent distinction between prosecution and proceedings was over. The Honorable Supreme Court said it applies both to civil and to criminal cases. Last but not the least in this subject, I will bring to your kind attention 1999, Volume 7, Supreme Court Cases, page 435. 1999, 7, Supreme Court Cases, Page 435. This was a case of malicious prosecution, which was described, which was decreed in favor of the appellant in the High Court. But the matter went to the Supreme Court on an issue where Order 41, Rule 22, I think all of you are experienced people, where can a party question an adverse finding against him without filing a separate appeal? Or, that was the gist of the crux of the matter which was being discussed in the Honorable Supreme Court. But it is a case pertaining to malicious prosecution, award of damages under pecuniary and non-pecuniary heads also. They were essentially discussing 4122, discussing whether a finding which is adverse to a party can be questioned by him without filing any objection or an appeal. But ultimately, the Lordship upheld the damages. Although it is a decision under 41 Rule 22, it also deals with the award of pecuniary and non-pecuniary damages. Therefore, for all the learned counsels who are participating and who wish in future or to, either to defend or to prosecute a case. These are the leading cases which I found for malicious prosecution. The question that survives for consideration as far as this head is concerned is, is this really an effective civil remedy? If you ask me my honest opinion, as a trial court lawyer who labored all his life in the trial court, I don't think this is really an efficacious thing. Because just imagine what is necessary to be proved. The mental element of the initial prosecution 
is what is required to be proved. It is not easy. That the initial plaintiff who started the malicious prosecution has started this with an element of malice in his mind and continued the prosecution or to be called an active prosecutor of that case with that malicious intent intact in his mind leading to a dismissal or an acquittal and thereby causing damage to the reputation or the property of the present plaintiff. All these factors have to be established in conjunction before a decree is signed. Therefore, I personally have a full opinion that this is not a real effective civil remedy in cases of malicious prosecution. I mean, all the seniors, I think, would agree with me that as we know, malice, malafides, you know, after Royappa, and all those leading cases on the subject, these are all elements which need to be pleaded and proved with certainty. And then one other question that also comes up is if the prosecution is launched, let us say wrongfully by the police, is a notice under section 80 CPC necessary for initiation of proceedings? If we go into the case law under 197 CRPC, the distinction between official acts and non official acts would come. Whether this is within the scope of his duty and not within the scope of his duty would come. But when we come here, we are prosecuting an officer, let us say, who has launched a prosecution with a malafide intention. Question would be, would a Section 80 be necessary before initiating the suit? I think it would be. Because Section 80 CPC says, for an act done or purported to be done in his official capacity. A notice is necessary before a suit is initiated for damages. And I'm leaving it open to all of you to think. I personally feel from plain language interpretation of section 80 CPC, a suit for an action done or purporting to be done needs to be preceded by a notice under section 80 CPC. These are all issues which would have to crop up. I just hope that some of you would take it up and there would be an authoritative pronouncement. Therefore, as far as the first part of the topic is concerned, namely malicious prosecution, my summing up would be that the remedies that we have today are difficult. It is not going to be an open and shut case. It requires a great deal of planning, a great deal of effort, careful discussion with your client to establish what the Supreme Court and the 857 Madras and other high courts have said are the essential ingredients. Namely, we can easily establish that the prosecution was initiated. We can easily establish that the prosecution ended in a dismissal or an equitable. We can establish the damages were caused to the reputation, person, etc. No problem. But the other elements of the malice in his mind, the malice with which it is prosecuted or, or pursued is a matter which you should keep in mind before you jump and test the waters here. Therefore, my submission as far as the first part of this is concerned is that neither Section 95 CPC nor 35A or the tort remedy of filing a civil suit is really an effective suit. But then you will have to appreciate the perseverance of these gentlemen who have pursued the cases in which have resulted in reported judgments. They are pursuing it. I am not dissuading you from doing it. All I am trying to say is be careful. The second half of the topic is the malicious arrest or the police excesses. Now this again is a topic which is very, very interesting. I mean this I would say with very great pride that this is where according to me the higher courts of the land the High Courts and the Supreme Court have rendered some absolutely human service in this direction. Particular emphasis would be on the Honorable Supreme Court of India for their perseverance, for their consistency, for the attempts that they have made for the last three to four decades to see that some amount of certainty comes to this branch of law, something that is really, really laudable. Police excesses are nothing new to all of us. Every one of us has come from a state where there has been one excess or the other. 
since we're dealing with Kerala, your most famous case, S. Rajan, soon after the emergency, and Mr. Warriors, his father's great fight for securing the whereabouts of his son, one of the most sordid sagas of Indian jurisprudence and Indian legal history, from Mr. Warriors' fight in that period, in 1978 to 81, sir, if I remember right. The emergency was missing, and uh, to the best of my recollection, he was not placed in trouble. Soon thereafter, we had the under trial prisoners in Bagalpur. 1981, the matter reached the Supreme Court of India. If you go through the history of this case, Bagalpur blinding, you will find four, I mean, some of them are recorded proceeding, one is the judgment where the Supreme Court pursued the matter and did not give it up. This was the first case where the Supreme Court took an active role and went beyond the normal confines of 32 and 226 and decided to take a proactive role. This is the case where you will find an anguish being expressed by the Supreme Court in asking and posing a question to themselves and saying, are we really helpless? Are we powerless in such a situation? Should we not devise necessary tools to meet this eventuality? This is a question that is posed. 16 under trial prisoners were found to be blinded. Then the matter reached the Supreme Court. Four times the matter was taken up. And ultimately, the Supreme Court gave some diet. These are the judgments which are known as the Khatri 1, 2, 3, 4. KHA, TRI, Khatri 1, 2, 3, 4 are the four judgments where you will find that the Supreme Court did not satisfy itself by referring these people, these under trial prisoners to a hospital and keeping quiet. It pursued the doctors, it pursued the treatment, ensured that they were getting good treatment in Delhi and for the first time it posed a question to itself. Are we helpless or are we powerless or can we do something about it? This was in 1981. In 1983, Another interesting question came before the Supreme Court in the form of a habeas corpus. A person who was acquitted honorably was still in prison for 16 long years. 16 years after he was acquitted, that gentleman was in prison. For 16 years. He immediately filed a habeas I'm sorry, not immediately the wrong word. He filed a habeas corpus. Immediately, state of Bihar said he has been released. He's no longer in our custody. Therefore, the infection has become infectious. The Supreme Court could have held that the detainee has been produced. The writ has become infectious, but it did not do so. It decided to address the issue. Why this gentleman was in prison for 16 long years after his acquittal and proceeded for the first time to award some damages for this police excess and wrongful arrest or detention. This case is 1983. Four Supreme Court cases, page 141. 1983. Four. Supreme Court cases, page 141. If you see the dates, this gentleman was acquitted in 1982. He was acquitted in 1968. In October, he files a habeas corpus. Immediately, he is resigned. The relief sought, he is released. The relief sought by the petitioner for his release thus became infructuous. But despite that, we directed a show cause notice to be issued. This is the reason why I said the Supreme Court took a stand which is really praiseworthy and continued to take that stand. Therefore, for the first time after Khatri, where they felt under 32 and 226, is there a remedy open or not to redeem or maybe repair some part of this wrong? In 1983, for the first time, a tentative step was taken forward. Yet I am just quoting from para 9 of the judgment. But the important question for our consideration is whether in the exercise of jurisdiction under 32, this court can pass an order for payment of money if such order is in the nature of compensation 
consequential upon the deprivation of a fundamental rights. The petitioner contends he is entitled to compensation for his illegal detention and that we ought to pass an appropriate order for payment of compensation in the habeas corpus petition itself. Neither did the petitioner keep quiet nor did the Supreme Court give up the case. Then the Supreme Court came to the conclusion in these circumstances, the refusal of this court to pass an order of compensation in favor of the petitioner will be doing lip service to his fundamental right. Article 21, which guarantees the right of life and liberty, will be denuded in, of its significant content if the power of this court was limited to passing orders of release from illegal detention without doing anything further. They could have been, they would have been within the book, strictly according to the statute, if they said, he is released, the purpose of the petition is over. But they felt that the scope and ambit of 21 would be denuded if they do not pass an order granting compensation. Therefore, the state must repair the damage done by its officers to the petitioners and it can have the course and they awarded damages. This is the first case where the steps that were contemplated in 81 were taken. This was followed I mean, as I said earlier, I have chosen cases which I felt were, they could be better cases which you could find. This was followed, in my opinion, by the next case of Neela Abhati Behera, 1993-2, Supreme Court cases, page 746. The first was a case of a habeas corpus fiction, filed by, filed by a detainee. Second is a case filed by a mother for the death caused to her son because of police atrocities. This was actively pursued by the mother, 1993-2 SCC 746, Neela Bhati Behera versus Stater. In the intervening period, there was also the Union Carbide case, the Bhopal gas tragedy case. There also the Supreme Court <laughs> was looking into creating a new head or a new principle for awarding damages. That also, as most of you are aware, was a proportion of a magnitude that India never saw till then. What was the manner in which damages could be awarded, how they could be awarded, was a very big issue, strict liability and other issues flowed out of it. There also the Supreme Court was called upon to decide the damage. There also the, that the 93 was Union Carbide, 91 was, 1983 was Rudal Shah, then late, nine, 91 was Union Carbide. In 1993, a young boy was picked up, Neelabad Behera's son, and later, his body was traced. The police, as usual, said he tried to escape from our custody. Therefore, he was found dead with injuries on the railway track. Medical evidence was collected, commission of inquiry, etc. And the medical evidence clearly proved that the injuries were made with a blunt object. Therefore, they came to a conclusion that lattice were used, third degree methods were followed. Now, the question that came before the Supreme Court was here by then, since the law was evolving, very quickly. Comprehensive arguments were advanced, including the principle of sovereign immunity and an argument that the state cannot be held liable because this is a discharge of a police function. Most of you know the case. Vidyavati. Yes, yes. Custodial torture. <laughs> sovereign function, custodial torture. <laughs> ah, yes, sir. So these are the arguments that are advanced before the but also, then I'll draw, you know, 65, of course, is the famous case, Kasturi Lal, 65 Supreme Court Constitution bench, where they said the food grains were seized. And they said, this is a sovereign function, you cannot sue us for damages. So then slowly the distinction between sovereign function, non-sovereign functions, slowly it came to be developed. And in this case also, in paragraph 14, after the argument was advanced, here the question that the Supreme Court was solely focusing its attention was, if there is a naked, blatant violation of the fundamental rights, should we keep quiet or should we get bogged down in all these procedures? Should we mould the relief to grant uh, some compensation or the other? The Supreme Court slowly, step by step, that, that is the aim of my presentation today. And I leave the conclusions. To you. In paragraph 14, they say, it is sufficient to say that the decision of this court in Kasturi Lal, that is 65 Supreme Court, sovereign immunity, Upholding the state's plea for tortious acts of its servant 
is confined to the sphere of liability in tort, which is distinct from the state's liability for contravention of fundamental rights to which the doctrine of sovereign immunity has no application whatsoever. They drew the distinction and said, whence there is a blatant violation of a person's fundamental right, our power under 32.226 is not circumscribed. We can award damages and sovereign immunity is not a defense that is available. Sovereign immunity is no defense to the constitutional remedy under 32 and 226 of the Constitution, which enables the award of compensation for contravention of fundamental rights when only when the only practicable mode of enforcement of fundamental rights is the award of compensation. And then, <clears throat> please remember, the first thought came to the Supreme Court in 1981 when they were dealing with Bhagalpur blinding. We, were, we are now in 1993. Twelve years later, the Supreme Court gives a categorical pronouncement and states, a claim in public law for compensation for contravention of human rights and fundamental freedoms, the protection of which is guaranteed in the Constitution, is an acknowledged remedy for enforcement and protection of such rights. And a claim based on strict liability made by resorting to a constitutional remedy provided for the enforcement of a fundamental right is distinct from and in addition to the remedy in private law for damages in tort resulting in contravention of fundamental rights. Supreme Court in 1993 realizes and states categorically you have a right to sue in civil law for damages for wrongful there is for police excesses. You have your right to sue them. Apart from that, you also have a constitutional remedy of approaching the High Court or the Supreme Court under 32 and 226 if your fundamental rights are trampled upon in any manner. Two distinct remedies were carved. The first was a remedy existing in common law and tort law, which was there, which is recognized. And a new remedy, 12 years after the thought came to the Supreme Court's mind, is now carved out and set in stone, if I may say so. This is in paragraph. The constitutional tort. Ah, yes, I'm grateful. De that is the de development. Great. I think we will end with Justice Ravindran's judgment with Upahar, and then we'll leave, leave the floor open. That's the constitutional thought. Because, sir, one of the issues that is coming up is the Honorable Supreme Court and High Court and the plenary powers are granting compensation. There, there is no real basis as to how they awarded the compensation. I think only in that Upahar case, the constitutional thought and some yardsticks are now being given for because tomorrow, if somebody wants to file a civil suit, the question would be, how would you prove your damages? So now at least we've got two or three methods to prove it, sir. I'm grateful. I'll come to that, sir. <clears throat> Particularly, the Supreme Court in paragraph 20 has said, this remedy of a constitutional <clears throat> recourse should be available when invoked by people who are poor by the have-nots <laughs> who are not possessed of the necessary wherewithal for enforcement of their rights in private law, etc. Therefore, particularly, they drew the attention of the people who are suffering, who cannot really approach the courts, and they also recognize the fact that the delays that often occur may be a problem worse than the original problem itself. Therefore, the Honorable Supreme Court, and finally in 1993, 12 years after they recognized the first problem that is, has finally carved out and said this is a distinct remedy which is available and ultimately awarded 1,50,000 as compensation. In fact, uh, if you read it, the beautiful judgment once again, where slowly they took the evolution of the law and they said, they, as I said earlier, 1981, they're saying we should evolve new methods. Then they say also say the pick and shovel are no longer suitable for mining of coal. The procedure of mandamus, certiorari, and actions of the case are not suitable for winning. They must be replaced by new and up-to-date machinery. And that is the machinery that they have come. They have also said that the relief of monetary compensation and exemplary damages in proceedings under 32 or 226 for an established infringement of the indefinable right guaranteed under 21 is a remedy available and is based upon the strict liability principle. 
Then you also have the famous case of D.K. Basu, sir. I think all of you are aware of it. D.K. Basu 1, D.K. Basu 2. I am tracing the evaluation of the law. D.K. Basu is 97-1 Supreme Court cases, page 416. 1997-1 Supreme Court cases, page 416. Why it is important for our discussion today is that the prayer made in that application filed before the court was to examine the issue in depth and to develop a custody jurisprudence. The jurisprudence suited to these custodial deaths and custodial excesses. The prayer was to develop a custody jurisprudence and to formulate modalities for awarding compensation to the victim or to the family members of the victim for the atrocities and the death caused in police custody and to provide accountability for the police officers. This was the question that was posed. There, the Supreme Court was discussing the effect of custodial torture. What is torture? The effect it would have on the mind of a person. Most of you who are in active practice would have used this judgment innumerable number of times, one of the leading judgments of the Supreme Court. Ultimately, in paragraph 14, 40, I'm sorry, paragraph 40 of this judgment, they describe what are the punitive measures that can be taken for this custodian jurisprudence which is requested to be evolved by the petitioner before the Supreme Court. To be just to be remedium, there is no wrong without a remedy. Therefore, a mere declaration of the invalidity of an action or finding of custodial violence or death in a lockup does not by itself provide a meaningful remedy to a person whose fundamental right to life has been infringed. Much more needs to be done. They considered all the provisions that were available in the IPC and then the Supreme Court held these provisions are inadequate to repair the wrong done to a citizen. Prosecution of an offender who is responsible for the custodial violence or the death is an obligation of the state in case of every crime but the victim of the crime needs to be compensated also. Therefore, if the court must proceed further and give compensatory relief, not by way of damages in a civil action, but by way of compensation under the public law jurisdiction for the wrong done due to the breach of a public duty by a state. The old doctrine of relegating the aggrieved to the remedies under civil law limits the role of the courts too much as the protector and custodian of the indefeasible rights of the citizen. The courts have the obligation to satisfy the aspirations of the citizens because the courts and the law are for the people and are expected to respond to their aspirations. A court of law cannot close its consciousness and aliveness to stark realities. Punishment of the offender cannot give solace to the family. Civil action for damages is a long drawn and cumbersome judicial process. Monetary compensation for redressal is therefore useful and probably the effective remedy. That is the then, of course, in D.K. Basu 2, which is 2015, eight Supreme Court cases where, again, these issues of custodial death, etc. were being continued. The Supreme Court still gave further directions. Installation of CC cameras, visits by people, etc., etc. And this was in 2015. In fact, yesterday, I don't know how many of you, SCC Online, the first judgment that was reported there in that SCC Online, about installation of CC cameras. 2019 also, we are still searching for implementation of these implement of these cameras. Then, BK Basu 1 and 2, they are a part of the series. I don't want to go into them. They are more procedural in aspect. The reason why I am referring to them is to show the march of law and the way in which the Supreme Court constantly pursued this. Starting from 1981, Till 1997, DK Basu, 2015. And the next case that I would like to draw your attention to is Brini Johar, 2016. 11 Supreme Court cases, page 703. Two 
2016, 11 Supreme Court cases, page 790. It is a typical case of a civil wrong being converted into a criminal case. The simple sale of equipment and the failure to pay the consideration was converted into a 420 and the typical normal action of cheating, etc. A lawyer of 36 years standing was arrested in Pune for an alleged case of cheating and a doctor. These were the two petitioners. The wrongful arrest, police excesses, despite 1981 Supreme Court onwards, is still continuing. Matter went to the Supreme Court in 2016. The Honorable Supreme Court, we are talking of the manner and method in which arrests should be effected. DK Basu gave directions, flouted again. And in 2016, the Supreme Court says this in Rini Johar in paragraph 9. Ordinarily, we would have asked the petitioners to pursue her remedy before the High Court for quashing, etc. But a disturbing note, but a disturbing one, the petitioners while appearing in person agonizingly submitted to this court that this court should look into the manner in which they have been arrested. How the norms fixed by this court have been flagrantly violated and how their dignity has been sullied, permitting the atrocities to reign. It, it was urged that if this court is prima facie is satisfied that the violation of arrest, etc. are impermissible in law, they would be entitled to compensation. That a party was contended on merits. 1997, DK Basu, directions for arrest. 2016, a complaint was being made in person before the Honorable Supreme Court of India of the manner in which they were arrested and the flouting of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court held after considering their sentencing that in the case on hand, there has been a violation of 21 and the petitioners were compelled to face humiliation. They have been treated with an attitude of insensibility. Not only are there violations of the guidelines issued in DK Basu, there is flagrant violation of the mandate of law enshrined under 40 and 41 and 41 ACRPC. The investigation officers in no circumstances can flout the law with brazen proclivity in such a situation. The public law remedy which has been postulated in Nilabad, Behera and so and so, so and so has to be followed. Thereafter, 5 lakhs were awarded as damages to each of the petitioners. Apart from that, they exercised their power. Relying upon state of Haryana versus Vajanlal 82 Supreme Court, they decided to put an end to that FAR then and there and quash the whole thing. 97 to 2016, despite the best efforts of the Supreme Court, Nothing has really changed. Then in 2017, another good public interest litigation reported in 2017, 10 Supreme Court cases, 658. This is a case of inhuman conditions in 1382 prisons. This is the case, the inhuman conditions in 1382 prisons. In this also, you kindly go, if you go to In fact, to those of you who are interested, this judgment actually deals with the end. Three, four, three fourth of the law that I have picked up, and the other one fourth is also there. Paragraphs 46 to 49 actually has the growth of law in this field. They also refer to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, 1966 which says that anyone who has been a victim of an unlawful arrest or detention shall have an enforceable right of compensation. Some Western countries have brought their law on par with this. India, unfortunately, has not yet done it. The International Convention on Civil and Political Rights. Ultimately, in this case also, they have given a number of directions. And ultimately, they said several cases documented and undocumented all over the country in spite of repeated decisions delivered by this court and perhaps every high court there seems to be no let up in the custodial deaths. This is not only a sad but a tragic state of affairs indicating the apparent disdain of the state to the life and liberty of individuals particularly those in custody. The time to remedy the situation is long past 
and yet there seems to be no will and therefore no solution inside. This is, sir, the anguish of the Honorable Supreme Court of India, who has been trying consistently from 1987 to 2017 without an ending. In this interim period, there is one wonderful case from, I have kept that and the Uhar tragedy case separate. First, of course, is the famous ISRO scientist who was wrongfully detained, Nambi Narayan. Nambi Narayan. Nambi Narayan. According to me, Nambi Narayan and Upahar, Upahar victims case, sir, now give us a remedy to pursue in a civil court. As I said, the damages that were given are not quantified under any head. The Supreme Court in the, ex in the exercise of its power, at 32, has been awarding damages. It started with very low damages in 1981, came up all the way to 5 lakhs in Rini Johar. But in Nambi Narayan's, in Nambi Narayan's case, they awarded 50 lakhs as damages. And in the Upahar victim's case, as you rightly pointed out, Justice Ramkumar, they came up with this constitutional tort. They adopted the method that usually follow in motor accident cases. They decided to take the multiplier methods, age, income, dependence, etc. for calculating damages. At least some tangible yardsticks are now available for assessment of damages, particularly when a civil suit is filed. If we go into Nambi Narayan, this is actually a case relating to malicious prosecution. In fact, his complaint before the Supreme Court was he has been maliciously prosecuted. Anyway, this is reported in 2018, 10 Supreme Court cases, page 804. 2018, 10 Supreme Court cases, page 804. Nambi Narayan, as you all know, was a well-known scientist working for ISRO. He was wrongly arrested under the grounds of espionage. Inquiries by the Kerala government and by the CBI found that he was not at all involved in the alleged offence. And he was honorably acquitted, honorably exonerated. Police officer against whom, <clears throat> who conducted the investigation, they were proceedings were directed to be taken against him. Here in this case also, the Supreme Court went a step further in quantifying the damages, considering the reputation and the status of the individual. First, I'll draw your to your attention to paragraphs 35 onwards of the judgment. Make very interesting reading. I'll just highlight a few important portions. Paragraph 35. There has been some argument that there has been no complaint with regard to custodial torture. When such an argument is advanced, the concept of torture is, is to be viewed, is viewed from a narrow perspective. What matters is what has been stated in D.K. Basu, where the court said, torture has not been defined in the constitution or in any other penal law. Torture of a human being by another human being is an, ins an instrument to impose the will of the strong over the weak by suffering. The word torture today has become synonymous with the darker side of human civilization. It is quite vivid that the emphasis has been laid on the mental agony when a person is confined within the four walls of a police station or a locker. So even if there is no visible physical torture, the agony that a person sustains by the locker or by the detention illegally is the torture that the Supreme Court decided to proceed upon in this case. Therefore, they held the reputation of an individual is an insegrable part of his right to life with dignity. And then they are going to the other cases and ultimately come to the conclusion, we think it appropriate to direct the state to pay 50 lakhs as compensation to the appellant. They also directed proceedings to be taken against the officers. Other point which I would like to make clear to this August ordering, all the cases that the Supreme Court has ordered compensation, they have left it open that a regular civil suit for damages still lies. 
and that the compensation, if any, awarded can be offset in case damages are also awarded by the civil court. That brings us to the question, what is the yardstick that is available for assessing the damages in case you are successful in proving illegal detention, illegal arrest, custodial violence, etc. As I said, till now, all the cases that we have dealt with are dealing with the power that is there to the constitutional courts. But as Justice Ramkumar has rightly pointed out, Upahar tragedy has brought out a silver lining. In fact, Justice Ramkumar, if I am Sita Ramakumar, if I am a safer, and uh, Brother Ramakrishna, the only plus point I found out of police excesses are executive excesses. Only plus point or benefit. Happened, sir, 125 years ago in uh, South Africa when the barrister Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi was thrown out of a train. I believe he was thrown out of a train because of the high handed action of the executive. He yes. started visualizing the concept of non cooperation and satyagraha. That is what led to the ultimate moment. So the only silver lining I could find in this very depressing topic was that the Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Himself was subjected to executive excesses, and because of that, one particular incident, I believe, he started transforming himself from the barrister Gandhi to the Mahatma Gandhi that we know. Anyway, coming to Municipal Corporation of Delhi versus Upahar Tragedy Victims Association, 2011, 40 Supreme Court cases, page 481. 2011, 14. Supreme Court cases, page 481. For the younger generation who are listening in today, this is Upahar was a very famous theater in Delhi. Very, very popular with the youngsters and the it was located in a very upmarket colony. If I remember right, the movie Border, I think, was released. They had a full house. And it was a, a combination of errors that led to 57 deaths. Oil leaked from a generator, which is kept in the basement. The oil wet the, uh, the ignition came from the generator. The oil caught fire. Foam and other material which are used for seats in a cinema theater were there. They caught fire. They went up a narrow passageway into the balcony of the theater. The door of the balcony of the theater was locked because it was only used for egress and not for egress. So the smoke that started gathering got sucked into the air, con air conditioners. People in the balcony were suffocated in the day. It was a tragedy that was waiting to happen and it happened. A combination of factors led to the death of 59 people, number one, the adult injured. This was a long drawn battle. The prominent business house was the owner of the theater. They had the necessary resources. Right? But the parents and the people or the family members of the Upahar bound into an association and fought this very, very long time. The matter ultimately reached the Supreme Court of India. And in this case, as Justice Ram Kumar has pointed out, for the first time, Supreme Court has carved out an exception called a constitutional law, made it a ground for awarding of damages. Apart from that, they have also indicated the methodologies by which damages were calculated. Therefore, this judgment is important in case you are called upon to argue or to defend a case. I will draw your attention first to the question before the Supreme Court who is liable? There is an electricity board. Theater, there's a fire services department, there's a theater owners, all these people. The question of who will land the Supreme Court pin down the liability on one or two people? And the question is, should the entire liability be paid on placed on the electricity board or should it be placed on the owners also? The question is who is liable and to what extent? And then in paragraph 60. There was a discussion. The High Court, when it was awarding damages, took 15,000 as the nominal damage, as the nominal income of each adult who died. 
The question before the Supreme Court was, is this method of assessing damages right or wrong? The Supreme Court said this in paragraph 60. This gives rise to the following question, whether the income and multiplier method adopted to finally determine compensation can be arrived at while awarding tentative or palliative compensation by way of public law remedy under 226. And then, paragraph 65, while awarding compensation to a large group of persons by way of public law remedy, it would be unsafe to use a high income as a determinative factor. The reliance on Neela Bhati Behera in this case is of no assistance as the case related to a single individual and there is no specific evidence available as regards his income. Therefore, the proper course would be to award a uniform amount keeping in view the principles relating to award of compensation in public law remedy, reserving liberty to the legal heirs of the deceased victims to claim an additional amount whenever they are not satisfied with the amount of award awarded. Taking notes of the facts and circumstances, the amount of compensation awarded in public law remedy cases and the need to provide a deterrent, we are of the view that the award of so-and-so to a person aged about 20 years, 7.5 lakhs to those who are 20 years or below, as on date of the incident, would be appropriate, leaving it open to the reserving the liberty to the victims or the LRs, as the case may be, to seek a higher remedy. Insofar as death cases are concerned, the principle of determining compensation is streamlined by several decisions of the court. If these three factors are available, that is, age, income, and the number of decisions, the decision in Sarla Verma versus DTC could be pressed into service. Therefore, drawing support from the motor accident claim jurisprudence, Sarla Verma versus DTC, as you all know, is the leading judgment on the subject. Drawing sustenance from that, they have decided that this is a method available to assess the damages. Punitive damages were also awarded as 2 lakhs 50, 2 crores 50 lakhs. This was against the owners. Now, apart from this, this is a judgment of two judges. This is Ravindran and Radha Krishna. The initial part of the judgment that I read was of Ravindran. This is Radha Krishna called out this constitutional tort. This constitutional tort, you would find it from paragraph 98 onwards. Duty of care expected from a state or its officials functioning under the public safety legislation is therefore very high compared to the statutory expected from the officers functioning under the statutes. Constitutional tort, measure of damages. Constitutional court's action not merely strive to compensate the victim and vindicate their rights, but also to deter future constitutional misconduct without proper excuse or with some collateral or improper motive. Constitutional courts can, in appropriate cases of serious violation of life and liberty, avoid punitive damage. The same generally requires the presence of malicious intent on the side of the wrongdoer that is an intentional doing of some wrong act. This, in my view, is a judgment which you can present to service in case you are proceeding against a state authority who has exceeded brief or acts contrary to the limitations. Therefore, the Constitutional Court can, in appropriate cases, of serious violation of life and liberty award punitive damages. And then they say that further suggestions were given. Therefore, if you not look at this as they exist, the first match of cases starting from 1981 till date are cases where the constitutional courts have evolved a system of awarding damages. But you should also keep in mind that the Supreme Court has sounded a note of caution. It is not every case where there is a violation of a fundamental right that gives rise to the right to action. This note of caution was sounded in 2006, 3 SCC, page 178. 2006, 3 Supreme Court cases, page 178. In paragraphs 45 to 48, what happens is there should not be a docket explosion 
based on these cases. Therefore, the Supreme Court sounded a note of and said, cases where violation of 21 involving custodial death or torture is established or incontrovertible stand on a different footing, footing when compared to cases where such violation is doubtful or not established, where there is no independent evidence of custodial torture, where there is neither medical evidence of any injury or disability resulting from custodial torture, nor any mark, scar, it would not be prudent to accept the claims of human violation by persons having criminal record in a routine manner for awarding compensation. This would open the floodgates. Therefore, before awarding compensation, the court will have to pose the following questions to itself. Whether the violation of 21 is patent and incontrovertible, whether the violation is gross and of a magnitude to shock the conscience of the court, whether the custodial torture alleged has resulted in death or whether the custodial torture is supported by medical report or visible marks or scars or disability. Therefore, it is not every case of custodial, alleged custodial torture that you would get recourse in the constitutional courts only when there is clear evidence you have a right. Now, the next three or four cases that I would like to bring to your attention are civil, dis are civil cases where people have succeeded in getting some damages for these wrongful arrests, wrongful detentions, custodial violence, etc. I think already more than an hour has passed, so I will be a little brief here. The first time is, a, time is not a premium, sir. You can. Thank you. Thank you. But <laughs> still, no, I had a morbid fear of long arguments when I was a lawyer, so <laughs> I used to make my junior sit and run. <laughs> I try to avoid that now. Anyway. The first judgment, very interesting judgment, AR 1947 out, 48 out, page 135. A civil suit, this, now we are dealing with civil suits. AIR 1948 out, 135. This, uh, this was a judgment where the in Hansbury's laws of England was considered, and then damages, of course, were considered. And then they said, in an action for trespass, which essentially is an action for wrongful arrest, trespass of a person, as in contradistinction to malicious prosecution, in an action for trespass, the plaintiff only has to prove that there was an action or a high-handed action. And it is for the defendant to prove that there was a good cause and an excuse for that. AAR 1948 out, page 135. It is not necessary for the plaintiff to prove malice or want of a reasonable or probable cause. And it is for the defendant to prove that there was a justification. The second judgment is AAR 1979, Andhra Pradesh, page 31. This is Allah de Kupiswami, great judge, the great judge of our Supreme High Court, this is Allah In this case, in paragraph 12, AAR 19. 70, 79 Andhra Pradesh, page 31. In a case of tort for malicious arrest or false imprisonment, it is not necessary for the plaintiff to prove malice or negligence on the part of the defendant. It is sufficient if he proves that false imprisonment was caused by the defendant. And if the defendant cannot establish sufficient justification, he would be liable. It is held in order to succeed in a suit for law and damages and detention not necessary, etc. Various other cases were considered. Then 99 Gujarat, AAR 1999 Gujarat, page 316. This is also another very good judgment where a lot of law was considered and ultimately damages were awarded. Therefore, now, friends, we have two streams here. We have the Constitutional Court and damages being awarded by the Constitutional Court under their powers. And we also have some civil courts which have gone into the matter and awarded damages. Now, if you have to pursue one of the two, as far as Constitutional Courts are concerned, you should, in view of the caution sounded in 2006, be careful. 
that there is an established violation of your fundamental right, apart from the medical evidence. You should be able to prove that the detention, that the arrest was in blatant violation of your rights. Not an ordinary infraction, a blatant violation. That should be established. When it comes to a civil court for proving damages, if you have the capacity and the patience, you will have to prove that the trespass to the person took place without, took place. It is for the defendant to prove that he had a justifiable ground to cause the trespass or arrest. But now the question now is, how do you assess the damages? In my opinion, the Indian law has not really developed on this to an extent where you can get up and stand and argue that this is the law, therefore what the damage. But the silver lining is the fact that in Nambi Narayan, the Supreme Court said for long full damage, 50 lakhs, which is quite a big figure, was awarded in the Upahar tragedy case when there was a difficulty in calculating damage. There were 59 people dead and about 130 injured. The age, income, dependency, etc. of so many people cannot be proved with mathematical accuracy. The Supreme Court adopted a rough and ready method and calculated and awarded damages. They adopted the Sarla Verma versus BTC matter to bring in those three, age, income, dependency, etc. The multiplier method and then. So once the yardsticks are coming out, I would submit that a lawyer suing for damages for wrongful arrest Namely, if somebody is seeking a civil remedy for police excesses or wrongful arrest, is on a better footing today than he was in 1981 and 82 when the Supreme Court took upon itself the onerous burden of carving out this exception. Therefore, today you have a, in my opinion, you have a method, you have a, a set of yardsticks by which you can say these are good precedents to follow. Therefore, if there is a case of blatant violation, if there is a case of police excesses, a civil remedy is possible. Unlike Malice's prosecution, where I found my personal opinion, of course, was that the remedies were not really viable remedies, which would cause, because the whole idea of these damages is not merely to get compensation, but they should also act as a deterrent, so that in future, these sort of actions are stopped. That is one of the purposes of awarding punishment or uh, damages. If, as far as a civil remedy is concerned, I would put it this way, as far as malicious prosecution is concerned, I personally feel the law has to develop a lot more. As far as the civil remedies for illegal arrest, malicious arrest, police excesses, wrongful prosecution, the law has taken a good turn, a turn for the better. But what I would like to also bring to your kind notice is that even now the problem is not solved. Even now the Supreme Court is still chasing the powers that be to bring some legislation. If you look into the recent judgments of the Supreme Court in 2018, the Honorable Supreme Court of India directed the Law Commission of India in a case called the Bablu Chauhan case. 2018, they directed the Law Commission to examine this issue of custodial deaths, the violence of suffering, all these things. And uh, Justice, Dr. Justice B.S. Chauhan submitted a wonderful report to the government of India. This is the, I think it's the 277, 2017, Dr. B.S. Chauhan submitted a report wherein After considering the entire law of the subject, the provisions in the other constitution, in fact, Justice Chauhan noticed that the International Covenant of Civil Rights, which guarantees a right to seek damages for wrongful arrest, etc., has not been adopted by India, that it has been adopted by other. He went into the German constitution, he went into the UK constitution, he went into the other European nations, and also the American constitution. And notice that in all these case, countries, the, the constitution itself has been amended to include a section which makes state and state officials liable for excessive actions. Unfortunately, in India, there is no such thing. Therefore, just in this report, Justice B.S. Chauhan 
recommended that the CRPC should be amended. Special courts should be established to try these sort of offences because, as you all know, we are all lawyers and judges sitting here. The average life of a trial is six to eight years. Then the first appeal, second appeal, Supreme Court. It will be, in fact, rigorous imprisonment for the petitioner who approaches the court. Therefore, to alleviate that, the Lordship suggested special courts, summary procedure, power to award compensation, power to award interest. So, unfortunately, this has not been yet done. Similarly, we had a former law minister called Ashwin Kumar. He also approached the Supreme Court of India for seeing that this international covenant on human rights is adopted by the government of India. The government of India took a stand before the Honorable Supreme Court. I think just Sanjeev Khanna noted the three-judge bench and they noted that and said, we hope that soon a legislation would be there wherein all these things would be considered. Considering the fact that the Law Commission has studied this problem more than once and given very strict recommendations, it is unfortunate in one way that till date, no comprehensive legislation is yet in place to determine liability. However, if you look at the U.S. Code, what the United, what they call the U.S.C., there is a section 1983, which clearly states if a person under the cloak of a state or a central law violates the person or he takes action which is contrary to the, he is liable for action and thought. Therefore, my submission would be that in view of the Law Commission reports, in view of the law on the subject, the recommendation given by the Honorable Supreme Court in more than one case. I mean, we have Lalit Kumari, we have Arnesh Kumar, we have D.K. Basu. We have so many judgments where the Supreme Court has tried its level best to streamline this whole procedure, to regulate this whole procedure. And yet, judgment law is still being flouted with impunity. The fact that in 2018, they are still searching for CC cameras, or even today, yesterday's SEC online showed that they are still looking for the CC camera implementation, etc., still shows that there is a lack of a political will that is necessary to bring in an effective law. Therefore, as things stand, I would like to conclude by saying malicious prosecution, the remedy is still not well established, although it is there. In my opinion, it is not an effective remedy. As far as malicious prosecution is concerned, illegal arrest, deaths, police custody, excesses, etc. are concerned, we are in a much, much better position because of the evolution of law from 1981 onwards. As I said at the very outset, the Supreme Court took a very, very consistent step. The very first case where the habeas corpus has become infructuous, they would, the lordships would have been right in simply saying the application has become infructuous. But they did not stop there and continued to say, should we do something more? Should we evolve a new tool? And the new tool, in my humble opinion, has evolved. New methods have been found starting from Union Carbide round, right down to this is Ravindran in UP. There is a constitutional thought now. If an officer exceeds his brief, exceeds his statutory limitation, you have an effective remedy in suing him for damages. And I hope the cost regime in this country will also take a turn for the better. And punitive costs, realistic costs are imposed so that there would be some amount of deterrent. With this, I would like to conclude and say thank you for patiently listening to me. Yeah, that was a wonderful exposition of law. Over to the, before we go to the interactive session, uh, comments, this is Ram Kumar, sir. Thank you, sir. When I, when I recommended this topic to Mr. Shyam Patman, sir. even in my, even in my dreams, I never expected such a brilliant, excellent presentation of the subject. Okay. You have you done you have it was with a touch of class that you you dealt with the subject very methodological and uh, what should I say meticulous and uh, it had the touch of a of a um, trial a very very every, <laughs> a, everywhere there they touch this trial lawyer in you was surfacing <laughs> during the citation on how the judgment of how the court and Gujarat High Court. All they, they are the typical of a trial lawyers. Yes, sir. Those are bread and butter. <laughs> bread and butter. Method or very methodological. I would, in fact, I only want to add two aspects. That is what you very rightly said that it is very difficult to prove malice, because as as in the case of motive for a crime, 
malice yes. is in, uh, indebted very deep in the mind of the offender the person it is very difficult to fathom that therefore malice as you rightly said very difficult to prove then yes. one one uh, one decision i don't know whether the indian supreme court has approved that there is one decision of the privy council yes. which which i had uh, jotted down while while uh, as a lawyer conducting cases Uh-huh. I don't know. I don't know the Supreme Court has, of India has accepted. It is a case from India only. It is 10 Bombay law reports 1080, corresponding to 35 Indian appeals 189 Privy Council, where they say that even the insti- even if the institutional prosecution may be bona fide, but its continuance can be malafide. The institution yes. can be bona fide, but its continuance can be malafide. giving rise to an action for malicious prosecution that is uh, only for the sake of completion so you have touched on almost every aspect nothing <laughs> no stone has been left unturned by you then then one has one one decision is by justice krishna here again uh, that is a case where a, a more than the the initiator one particular witness was persecuting him like anything giving evidence and uh, he was virtually persecuted because not merely prosecution persecuting him like anything but witness and the question was whether the the he could he could be um, um, subjected to prosecution justice krishna has said no yes maybe maybe he is the worst person yes <laughs> who had persecuted you but being a witness you can't say that maybe the original initiator might have kept uh, quiet that is the citation i only wanted to give the citation 1971 K H uh, K L T 1971 K L T 798, where yes. co- the the plain it is not all other requirements of malicious prosecution have been beautifully dealt with, but if it is a witness, you can't prosecute the witness for malicious prosecution. Yes, Mr. Chair. Well, beautiful, excellent presentation, Mr. Thank you, sir. Thank so, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. How do you see that, Mr. Bhutti, sir? Guru Garu, take it easy. No, yes, sir. Awesome, sir. It's a matter of pride that he belongs to my high court. <laughs> <laughs> you are. You should be really proud of him. Yes, sir. He is somebody we all look up to, sir. He is our guiding role. I tell you about a case I argued before him after he finished. Sir, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this. Uh, I I would only say one thing. Suit for malicious prosecution. This a very suit for defamation. When we go to Nambi Narayan's case, where. Uh, his reputation was damaged ultimately compensation was also awarded keeping in view the defamation yes law. yes so there was a, a little overlapping here that yes. the two mean fields of if I, if i may answer sir in a case of malicious prosecution some damage must be caused either to the property or to the reputation so therefore invariably in malicious prosecution there is a loss of reputation also so there will be this overlap between the two remedies a person of repute is being subjected to all these vagaries therefore yes. nothing wrong if the court awards damage for that also excellent sir a fees to the years thank you, yes. thank you. it's a forensic uh, treat really <laughs> i will tell you about sita ramurthy garu sir normally we all know that order 38 rule 5 <laughs> talks of attachment <laughs> for judgment yes talks of a case where the defendant with an intention to defraud his creditors is stealing is leaving the jurisdiction or selling away his property time and again the ap high court and the jai supreme court have held you should categorically prove that the defendant is leaving the jurisdiction with an intention to defraud i had a case where there was a leading company which was not leaving the jurisdiction which was not defrauding anybody but its profits were steadily falling down and virtually the company was becoming worthless then i sought for an order under 38 rule 5 and i said and the lord chief as the metropolitan session judge of visakhapatnam gave me an order saying that the court also has a duty to protect a genuine plaintiff because that is the only asset that is there strictly speaking 38 rule 5 is not applicable because <coughs> that fellow is not the company was not running away it was not selling his asset but its regular balance sheet show every year the profit is drastically coming down. danger so i said please give me an attachment before it becomes junk and the lordship was pleased to grant me the attachment that was i mean 
It was also a path breaking decision. Because original thinking. Yes. Judges should have that original thinking. Yes. On first principles. Yes. It is our privilege that uh, we do have Justice Sita Ramamurthy as a regular. Uh, 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 he was there as a faculty and he used to come as a regular participant in uh, this platform. That was Wonderful. indeed a privilege Wonderful. for us. Wonderful. Yes. Justice Ramushan, sir. Really, it's a wonderful presentation, brother. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Really, it's a subject where not much of decisions will be available, and you will have to rely on the old decisions as how than other thing. <laughs> In courts, or not develop that way because the tortious liability, as far as India is concerned, is a foreign uh, thinking. It is slowly developing nowadays. Yes. But I think that as in the case of because I think that the Kerala High Court has uh, consistently maybe Ram Kumar be knowing. It is very yes. difficult because of the Kerala High Court decisions. It is very difficult to prove the malicious prosecution because in the case of police atrocities, etc., if there's some good faith has been shown, then probably they are protected. Because initially, yes. uh, arrest will be there for the purpose of uh, pursuing some complaint. Thereafter, it may turn into a uh, illegal act, atrocities or something that exists. So in that case, as I think that in one case, I think this is Katie Thomas has even gone to the extent of. Uh, uh, saying that uh, small uh, aberrations causing for the purpose of extracting a tooth cannot be said to be an illegal uh, yes. uh, uh, this thing. So that way, as far as uh, civil remedy is concerned, you, as you know, it is very difficult to prove this. But I think that the probably you will have to prove the probabilities. Probably. Because in a, in a criminal case, you will have to go beyond reasonable doubt. As far as the civil case is concerned, I think that it will be yes. enough. It will be it's enough. Perfect. Because we will have to develop law in that way. It will be enough to be able to say there is no probable cause for me to arrest me or yes. there is no probable cause for me to prosecute. But in order, yes. to, in order to help somebody else, this is being illegally used as a round, a round of a method for that purpose. So in you that case, we will have to justify. Opposite, opposite party will have to Burden will not be otherwise. It yes. will be very difficult for a common man to prove the why yes, or because they will come with always come with the FIR saying that there is a thing. So in order to uh, extract the necessary things. Probable arrest is required. Ultimately, he would have been let off by them also. But yes. during, during that period, because even recording the arrest, they will take for interrogation. That is a method yes. by which they proceed with interrogation. Only they have to record the arrest. Sometimes he will be there for uh, days. Sometimes nobody may knowing where he was taken. That is what what happened in uh, uh, Rajan's case. Yes. So, uh, so uh, that difficulty will be so in such cases. If a long-term procedure has been taken by them unlawfully or illegally without any reasonable cause, I think the courts will have to come to the rescue of the people and do that. As the Rajan case, Rajan case was a rare case where High Court took uh, evidence. Mm, evidence. In 226, mm. habeas corpus jurisdiction. Yes. Because the police had taken a view that uh, taken a stand that they did not arrest. It is only <laughs> on that. It is. I think it is thereafter the civil suit was filed by Isuru Rari and got some compensation was obtained. Based on the findings made by the High Court in the habeas corpus proceedings, because evidence was collected there. And criminal the chief minister, chief criminal minister was, was prosecuted for chief filing a false evidence. False evidence. He, he had lost. He has lost his uh, chief, minister. chief ministership. Also, thereafter, he has not come to chief minister as chief minister at all. <laughs> that is a, that is the first case where I think that the law has been evolved for the purpose of how the custodial things will not be taken. As, as you have said, from 1981 onwards, though the Supreme Court says the prison must be a corrective missionary and not a punitive one, because the persons have committed uh, crime. Maybe most of them are circumstantial persons who are subjected to do the, those things. So they should not be uh, seen in a vindictive manner. And uh, they will have to see that uh, some procedure will have to be made how to correct them and make them acceptable to the society. That must be the manner in which the jails will have to. But unfortunately, that is what is going on is contrary to that. So it's a very excellent presentation. Thank brother. you, sir. Thank you. Sir, before we open up for the deliberation, one doubt that has been lingering in the mind of many was uh, all said and done, there is a question of limitation coming in. Many of the police acts in different states yeah, say one. that uh, acts done under that act and bona fide done under the act ought to be filed within a period of one year or a lesser period of limitation than the regular three year we get. So if that be the, I mean, the Kerala new act was taken, uh, that provision altogether off, the, uh, it was there the old act. So can 
uh, can it not be said that all these atrocities or things which are done by the police can never be said to be a bona fide act under the act or under the color of the act? Yes, I think you should do that. That's the only way out. The malefide act, statutory notice is not necessary. The law is there. Uh, as far as I remember under the Municipal Corporations Act here, where there is a statutory notice where the court held more than once that if the act is malefide, there is no need for a statutory notice before initiating proceedings. Similarly, I think you should, that uh, one year... But then the other question is, which is the special act? Limitation Act is the special act or the police act? Which will prevail? Uh, in one of the cases, police Kerala, act was taken Kerala, to be Kerala, 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 I could have said it otherwise. Because police act, because they provide only six month period at that time. Yes. And they also took the uh, stand that it is the date on which the first cause of action of arrest or something arises and not the till of the yeah. culmin I mean, culmination, culmination. What Justice Ram Kumar said, sir, comes into initiation may be correct. In the middle, they might have used third degree methods. So suppose they detain him illegally for one month. At the 29th day, they hurt him. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Okay. Sir, and, we have... Uh, the one, one aspect, uh, I, I forgot to mention that. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, let, it, let, it, let the discussion go. Let you go on. Okay, sir. Uh, we have Praveen Kumar with a question. Praveen, can you put the question? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. My one question is, uh, police, uh, what we can do when police forges document uh, to frame uh, accused? When, do, when same document are available under RTA with accused? So the question, uh, uh, it appears to be that uh, when police officers forge a document to incriminate or uh, uh, to frame the accused. Again, atrocity, police atrocity only. Yeah, it is an excess. You can bring it within the excess. So even if the IPC provides any false documents have been created for the purpose of initiating false criminal cases, it is an offense yeah. under the IPC itself. So we have, uh, sir, the name is not shown. It is shown as iPhone. I'm unmuting you. Please do put the case. Unmute, sir. Anonymous. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they would have ended with the instrument name. That's why. Yes. Please unmute. Yeah. Yeah, this is Chetu Srinivas. I wanted to ask a question, but that was clarified later because of the discussions. I am very grateful. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you very much. Now we have... Uh, Mr. Shyam, three... permission. Sir, please. Before you go to the next caller. Yes. Yeah, when there are two periods of limitation under yes. different enactments, Sir. The, the enactment or the provision which provides for the longer period... Uh -huh. of... uh, correct. That is a French that... decision of Allahabad. That... That will invariably be the limited act itself. Yes. <laughs> Special statutes always confine the period of limitation. Yes, yes. lesser period only. Sir, uh, we have uh, Sri G. Lakshmi Ram Babu. Mm. Please unmute yourself, sir. You put your hand icon, that's why uh, I am. Uh, Unmuting, please. We have Nawaz Jan, please. Hello, sir. Good evening. First of all, I thank you very much for such a wonderful and insightful session, sir. Thank you so much. And, and I thank uh, His Lordship. Justice Ram Kumar, sir, for having recommended this session. No more, and no more Lordship. Avoid using, using, using Lordship. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Once a judge is always a judge. Oh, that is <laughs> yes. not a mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> no, even, no, even the Supreme Court says that you will have to avoid addressing Lordship because that is a colonial method of representation. Exactly. exactly. Madras High Court, Madras High Court has held in, uh, as early as 1957 that you will have to uh -huh. address the court as sir. No, no, even here, I, 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 I
my uh, no, it is not it is not the question of enforcing it is not being followed by the lawyers i can say that's yes. because that they are going by the practice. old practice in their <laughs> own <laughs> interest in their own yes. interest <laughs> yes yes and that is the most suitable word to address a judge <laughs> so my question is uh, regarding the fake and counter killing which we have recently witnessed in chotukarin incident in hyderabad as well as in lucknow that the based case so in all these police exercises as well as the custodial death of the innocent what are the immediate remedies because in every case it triggered a public you know uh, protest and only after that some action is being taken even to suspend the culprits so under such circumstances is there any imminent uh, redressal mechanism where a custodial death has been confirmed or where a, a person is killed in a fake encounter if it is not stop forth with then police raj will again come and the welfare state the concept of welfare state will disappear from our country so is there any anything in law that can immediately book the culprit in law regarding fake encounters and custodial deaths thank you sir that's my question no as things stand i don't find any remedy nothing for immediate <laughs> Uh, we had to find ways and means of doing things uh, unless the supreme court unless the high court the constitutional court award some compensation initially we will be subject to uh, later uh, civil suits uh, action <laughs> because for the uh, yeah. prosecution uh, first of all this uh, uh, as uh, lordship has rightly said the judgment has to be made in favor of the defendant only then he is entitled to go for a malicious prosecution Yes. by the time the time will elapse it will take a lot of time and it is as good as justice denied when yes. it is when the justice is delayed yes. so in that case uh, i'm asking whether there is any scope of uh, immediate uh, solution for this like uh, departmental actions are being taken i personally spoke to the director general of police tamil nadu after this tutikurin incident there was a video clipping widely circulated in kerala uh the physical torture of the uh, victims whereas he denied that it is not real it is a fake and fabricated one uh, the director of police himself has said so my question is is there anything even uh, the police department can take or the government can take any action other than by the court there is a police grievance cell i believe Hmm. Police complaining authority is there. Uh, Complaints authority in Kerala. <coughs> See, Shyam, there are. Shyam, I will give you. An, uh, yes, carry on, please. Sir, please, sir, you have to. No, 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 no. There's nothing. See, there are two issues. One is the wrong done to the person or the under trial who suffered it for whom only the custodial the damages are the. The other part is the in the department inquiry complaint to higher ups, etc. Today we are dealing with civil remedies for that. The other remedies are there. Depart definitely departmental inquiries will be held. Punishments can be imposed. But yes. here we are talking of victim yes. victim redressal. In fact, in fact, one other thing I also forgot, Ram Kumar sir. Yes. This in compensation we also have the victim compensation scheme where, where you know some yardsticks are now given yes. for which offence how much is to be. So therefore, for, I think that can Victim also market. be used sir as a yardstick to. Victimology, victimology is gaining, gaining uh, importance, gaining momentum. And uh, after the judgment of the Supreme Court, the some figures have been fixed. They can be used as the base for assessing damages also. Yes. Sham, I, I wanted to add something. Uh, there, there is an article of mine on, on encounter killings by police. I will give you that text. Okay, that we be. shall circulate in the group also. We I have will circulate in the group also, sir. Yeah, yeah we will. That is circulated. That's thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Shankar Raman has put the hand up. Yes, Please, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Sorry for actually the question which I uh, really thought of was already put. Anyway, I want one uh, clarification, sir. Really, 
recently in the suit filed by INX company against PVR, the Delhi Honorable uh, High Court awarded cost of 5 lakhs on the ground that it's a tortious inducement. And later on, the division bench set aside the cost on the ground of judicial adventurism. So kindly enlighten the same. <laughs> Cost was awarded on judicial adventurism for it. <laughs> so it is not uh, related to the present topic. <laughs> and another tortious case uh, as our uh, Leonard friends uh, interacted in detail with regard to tortious. Uh, though I may be wrong, but uh, when the COVID-19 was on 17-3-2020, that uh, Larry Clayman, who used to file various suits against Mr. Obama and other uh, filed the suit before the Texas court for 20 trillion on the ground of physical and emotional, emotional injury to the plaintiffs. And I got the copy of 27 pages plaint. And uh, what would be the fate? Sir? They okay. filed the suit against the People's Republic of China, People's okay. Liberation Army, Wuhan Institute of Virology, and uh, that Wuhan Virology Director, and all things, all other persons. And it is a tortious suit. How can we prophesy the outcome? <laughs> <laughs> Whether such a torch suit is like maintainable. Maintainable under the American jurisdiction or India? In the American jurisdiction. American, we can't comment. But yes, they, are made. they class action suits are known in America. Class action you know, as, for our, as for our CPC, section 86, whether we can file a suit, no, those class actions should now, I think in the recent amendment to the commercial uh, consumer court, right? Uh, consumer act, they are trying to bring in class action suits, but till now class action suits are not really taken up in India. So my question may be right or wrong. As per section 86, we can sue against the foreigners. No, no, suing after the getting after getting no, <laughs> no, that must be a cause of action must be arise for an Indian who has sustained injury yeah, on a torch, torch, uh, owing to owing to coronavirus. It's a torch suit, uh, torch is suit whether we can file after getting central government sanction as per section 86 CPC, sir. My the question may be right or wrong. The torch itself is yet to be proved. <laughs> uh, yes, that is okay. First question is whether it is from Wuhan or not is an issue. Exactly. Yes, whether yes, man-made, yes, yes, man yes. whether man-made, man deliberately. Wuhan. Wuhan. Yeah. Sir, Mr. Sham. Yes, sir. Bar, bar, bar. Class action writs are already permissible in India. Class action? Writs. Writs, sir. Not permissible. Correct, sir. Uh, we have uh, G. Lakshmi yes, Rambambu. Yes, Can you put yes. the question, please? Hello. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. My doubts are cleared. At, at, uh, initially, I raised my hand. Okay. Oh, he has, Thank he you. has not left any stone unturned. Yeah, that's why. So speaker, covered. Speaker, uh, as said, when the doubts came, they used to put the hand icon. But thereafter, doubts does not remain, it seems like. Nitin? Nitin, yeah. Yeah. Sir, Namaskar, sir. I've got a two doubts. One is for malicious prosecution and the second one is for this malicious arrest. Sir, I was of the opinion that uh, now there's a DK Basu guidelines are there. Then to also if the police are violating these things, only the person like Nambi Narayan or a petitioner, let us say, who's an advocate, they can approach her to the constitutional courts. What's, what about the layman, sir? How will he get the justice? Only he will approach to the constitutional court and that is not uh, cheaper for a common man. And I mean, what is the remedy in that case, the faster one? See, many of the cases that we dealt with today were cases which were filed by public spirited citizens or by NGOs. I don't think uh, that should be such a deterrent today with, you know, so many NGOs act like, you know, D.K. Basu was a case where sir, West Bengal NGO went and said evolve a custodial jurisprudence. So therefore, I don't think it should be such a big fear. You will find a method which uh, you can approach the Supreme Court or the High Court. It shouldn't be a fear. And another set of fast, fast track courts will come. <laughs> <laughs>
And sir, the second question was for malicious prosecution. First, you have given the citation 2000 volume 3 SCC page number 640, wherein sir uh -huh. you stated that if there is an attachment order, uh, then there will be a criminal trespass against the party, and that party was not in proceeding. So can it be against a court receiver also, or that will be against the plaintiff who had secured this order? It will be only against the plaintiff who has secured the order with that intent in mind, the malicious okay. intent in his mind. Okay. Receiver Thank is only you. only obeying the orders of the court. Ah, receiver. As an no, since of... there was a word of a criminal trespass, so I am like the actual trespass has been done by the receiver. So I was, I'm sorry. So I was thinking. That's okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Nitin. We have Ishita Hello. with a question. Ishita, please. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah you are. Yes, with sir. Sorry, I'm audible. audible. Yeah. Uh, my one question is uh, that in my one of the case, uh, my IU changed some document and uh, forgery done in that document. When I applied before JMIC, uh, they said there is just uh, cutting in dates. Uh, then uh, it will not uh, attract uh, Section Four Sixty Six. Pending case, legal advice. <laughs> <laughs> sir, there are two aspects. Sir. One thing, if a document is forged even before it is filed into court, the remedy is elsewhere. Four ninety five one B will not apply. Yes, sir. If it is forged after it is brought to the court and the document is custodial, it is then the court can take action. The court officer will file a complaint and it will be prosecuted. Three forty, three forty CRPC can be invoked only in such case. I think that there is one decision in Kerala High Court is there on that aspect. Any number? There are plenty of decisions. One ninety five, one A, and one B. One B is the uh, constitution bench has decided yes. that unless the document is in custodial ages, the four sixty five will be attracted only when the document is in custodial ages. Why in the custody of the court the document should have been forged? If a for the already for the document has been filed in court, four sixty five one ninety five one B is not attracted. Constitution constitution oh. is there. Uh, Millership that was for before the court. For the for filing the court in the court. For filing in court. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Millership. Vijay has put the hand up. Vijay, please. Yes, yeah. sir. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, very much. Uh, See, the doubt I had is with regard to section 95. See, in 95, uh, the defendant can make an application for grant of compensation if uh, the proceeding is uh, not on a, a fair thought. See, I wanted to know whether this 95 inquiry is a summary inquiry or a elaborate inquiry. If it is an elaborate inquiry, how do we reconcile the restriction to 50,000 and a fresh suit to unlimited amount? See, no, there are. I I am rephrasing my question. The inquiry under ninety five is also on the same parameters. Only if it is malicious. But a fresh suit, there is no time. There is no monetary limit for grant of uh, compensation. How do we reconcile for the same inquiry by the same court? Is one one doubt I had. I have I have I have heard your lordship's uh, reference to a. Uh, judgment of Supreme Court, wherein uh, the doctrine of election was uh, yes. sought to be taken by the applicant, but this reconciliation is a little, little odd. No, if you, Mr. Vijay, if you go by what is said in ninety five, it merely says the defendant may apply to the court, and the court may, upon such application, award against the plaintiff fifty thousand. It does not say it is merely an interlocutory application. Just says you can apply to the court. So I I don't know. Subject to correction, what the others may say, this also appears to be a civil suit in which the maximum damages you will get is fifty thousand. Yeah, plain reading of ninety five does not indicate it is only a summary inquiry and an interlocutory application. It merely says the defendant may apply to the court. To but then there would be an inquiry for that. Yeah, there necessarily will be a inquiry. How do we reconcile the fresh suit with a ninety-five inquiry? No, no. 
see, you choose either if your client will be satisfied with 50,000, then a 95. If you want more than 50,000 in terms of your assessment of the damages, you should go for a civil suit. What all I am trying to understand is the nature of inquiry remains the same. What no, should no. no, when you know when it comes to the suit, the procedure is entirely different. Usual procedure. Usual procedure. No. Enquiry with regard to proof of malicious prosecution is what am I mean. 95 is concerned with orders under 94 only. It is confined. You just read what is the first sentence. Same orders the... that has been passed there. That is orders passed under section 94. It is confined only to orders passed under section 94. Not a general ratio. No, but Mr. Sham, I don't know yeah. about Kerala. The prevalent scheme in Andhra is every application has 94, 151 added to it. 38 rules were read with 94, 39 rules were read with 94. So, yes. if it's burned a suit, some order is granted under the preceding section. That's yes. what the it says. So, no. that means any order passed under 94. 94 confines no, no. only to 94A to E. No, no. Fair enough. But Mr. Vijay's question is, if a wrongful order is, let us say, passed under 94, yes. will there be a summary inquiry or will there be a detailed inquiry? Detailed inquiry. Mm. That's the question. And is there a, an ouster of civil suit, regular suit? Yes, sir. 95 clause 2 says there is an ouster. Definitely okay. there is an ouster. As far as an order of 94, if it is obtained in a malicious mode, you have to resort to 95, which of course is a normal inquiry, as in a normal interlocutory application. No other remedy. No other remedy. You have been ousted as if under section 47. There is an ouster for a suit. So that means you have to go and follow all the procedures of a suit. That is not the thing here. As and in the case of order 21, order 39, rule 2A. Correct. Yeah. Sir, sir, may, may I mean... Yes, sir. Uh, sir, please. Yeah. For obtaining compensation under this section, no application is necessary. Correct. And no procedure or formality to be followed. The decision is A year 1917 Madras 885. 17 Madras 885. Then an order under this section has to be passed as an order collateral to the decree or decisions in the suit and not as a part of the suit. 1961 to MLJ 454. But is that the only remedy? If that is the only remedy, yes, sir. Then then it will be like order 39 rule 2A. Yes, no sir. other remedy. Yes, of course, 151 can always be. <laughs> but still, when there is an existing provision, yes, so that is why that uh, fifty thousand is been limited to fifty thousand. Or it could have uh, been much more. Fifty thousand dollars is the two thousand two amendment. Yeah, that is why I said this is not a real effective remedy. Fifty thousand in today's uh, exactly, exactly, exactly. Uh, compensation. If we, and if we invoking section ninety five. Will bar is a regular suit. That yes, will be very... may atrocity or atrocity. Yes. Double <laughs> Sir, uh, we'll take one more question before we wind up. That is from Manmeet. Manmeet, please. Good evening, sir, to all the learned justices and the learned friends. I have one request and one question. Like we have been seeing all the cops in India, Pan India, they have been taking disguise of their uh, state wise uh, police manuals and everything. Can't we do anything that we should have one police manual for Pan India as we have only one MHA which is governing them, one IPC, one CRPC. There has been a lot of abuse like interstate arrest. They are not taking the transits from the magistrate, not doing that uh, medicals and everything. It ought to be. It ought to be. No, it is a being a state subject, law and order, and uh, police comes under them. I don't think that the central government will come with any. That was the reason why the Supreme Court is issuing directions in the how this will not be dealt with, etc. Like we have Pan India, one Supreme Court, IPC is one, CRPC. Can't we move to MHA with some recommendations? Anything can be done to streamline the law, to stop the abuse. Nothing wrong. It is desirable. It is a desirable, it is a desideratum which is desirable. <laughs> but uh, states will say it's, no. It's always it, it is a challenge. But why not try? You mighty lordship is there to guide people like us. Don't include me. I am a very. <laughs> no, your guidance would be very very big enough. 
there had been lot of abuses sir they are like now they are doing like they are gundas i'm from delhi what i see here it's no more our kids would be in hell after 20 or 30 years that's so you what about the recent <laughs> occurrence in tamil nadu tamil nadu but if recent. it is delhi it is already governed by the central government sir delhi i said na we are governed by gundas so something <laughs> has to be done <laughs> Gundas in police, we can say. Mm-hmm. Uh, sir, local law is with the uh, Gundas only, na khakis. Mm-hmm. Yes, Gundas in khaki uniform. <laughs> yeah. Well, somebody can move the Supreme Court and say for a uniform uh, direction. I think, I think, I think already there was some direction issue with the Supreme Court, but then, then they are, they will not follow because. So what about the Industrial Disputes Act? The amendment has not been brought into force, despite three or four directions by the Supreme Court. They will go to, the, they will come, come out with a stand that you cannot, you cannot issue directions to the legislature or to the court to bring up, bring, bring into force a legislation or to enact a legislation. Such direction cannot be issued. That is the sir, stop, stop sir, answer. Sir, the finest example would be Section 66A of the uh, uh, Information Technology Act. It Why? Been held to be what about, what about higher purchase law? Up. What yeah. about higher purchase law? 1970 onwards, it is in cold storage. Yes. <laughs> so we have advocate Dilip with a question. Dilip, please. Good evening, sir. Thank you very much for this uh, illuminating discourse. <laughs> sir, my question is with regard to exclusively regarding civil remedies for malicious institution and prosecution of civil suits. And with regard to section 95, my opinion is that they are the conversation postulated under that section and the inter- arrest attachment and injunction mentioned in the section are only those orders described in class in section 94 subsequent proceedings which are orders pententilite no only interim orders not final orders right. the other conditions for the grant of compensation are the court should be satisfied that the orders were passed on inception grounds the court itself should realize that it was Insufficient grounds, the orders were passed. <laughs> then the court also finds that the court suit was not instituted on the The suit was not instituted on the basis of the probable grounds. No malice is required. No malicious intention need be elicited or proved. Only that the defendant may or shall file an application for compensation. And the award of compensation, if it is awarded by the court, by that court, only bars suits on those wrongful interim orders. And not on the decree of dismissal, ultimately passed into suit. So the bar is restricted only to a further suit on the same orders which were challenged in section 94, not on the ultimate decree. So, yes, suit. No, ultimate decree is only for realization of money. Mm. Granting money decree or not decree, that's all. No, the final dismissal mm. of the suit is still challengeable if it comes under the malicious prosecution or institution of the suit. Correct, correct, because correct. That is correct. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And, and they confines your orders under 94. Five classes 94, of 94. And, and they are only interim orders. Right. Section 94 pertains only to interim orders. Clearly states the chapter, is, I mean, the section itself starts with the And also it said on, on such arrest, the, the arrest suit is confined to the uh, suit against su- such arrest, attachment, or the injunction. Right. That is specified in the section. Under the preceding section, correct. Under yes. 94. That's what yes. I told. Yes. Then, per contra, section 35 of CPC is the satisfaction of the court itself, not by the agreement, that the suit is false and vexatious. In the, they are no, also, there, no, no, there also, there also it is there in the written statement you will have to raise, mm. that it is, you are entitled for a compensatory cost. Yes. Because the, 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 you, have raise, you, are, you will have to plead, unless, the, unless it is pleaded, court will not go to that person. Specifically claim. My, my, my submission is with regard to section 35A, which does not contemplate a prayer or, or, or a pleading also. Right. 35 says, the court shall, on satisfaction, the, right. that the, the suit has been wrongfully instituted with, a, uh, uh, with false and vexatious, and the suit is false and vexatious in nature. No marriage also need be proved there. It's clear because 35, 35A and 35B you have. B, B, B. Yes. So my B is compensated my, because my, is. my humble opinion is that suit for malicious distribution of a civil suit is not expressly barred by section 95.2. 
and such remedy is still available to a succeed a defendant if so advised and feel considerably unavoidable we have to be examined i am not very sure i will have to examine the statute is very clear sir the reading of the statute is very clear it gives no ambiguity that is again opinion <laughs> pardon five instances under 94 absolutely correct 94 a to e orders pass under 94 a to e no but no, it, section but section 95 takes only a to c and not but, but supposing there is a but the supposing there is a malicious arrest in those proceedings arrest also is the isn't it delete yes. also yes. supposing that arrest turns out to be malicious then will it preclude his right to claim compensation under the general law section 9 cpc i i, I submit that the truth the if it uh, that requires admit uh, ultimate conviction i mean uh, acquittal and acquittal against acquittal he is entitled no, for malicious arrest should there be acquittal arrest, arrest. for malicious arrest the civil criminal prosecution that malicious is malicious prosecution, prosecution. Uh, not for malicious arrest malicious supposing if there is a malicious arrest involved in a, in the proceedings under section 95 then will it or will it not bar a regular suit of For malicious arrest. No, even no, in a case, case, no, even in a case where you have committed a crime. Yes. Suppose D K Basu was violated. Yes. You have not been arrested. You have not been produced before the court within 24 hours. Exactly. All those things, even ultimately you are convicted. Also, your your human right uh, violation is always there for that. Exactly. Retention beyond 24 hours without any justifiable cause. It was in one one case. Supreme Court said. He, the police officer, whatever may be the reason, he cannot give a reason that he he, he retained it beyond 24 hours, except the time taken for journey for transit. Mm. Ah, Ramkumar sir, my my yes. observation is this 94 and 95 pertain to only civil suits, arrest made in a civil suit. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But even then, your liberty is curtailed, constitutional no. right is violated, is it not? No, 95 then, then, is bar only to such arrest, such arrest made in a civil proceeding. All right, yes. but then even then that can involve a constitutional tort also, is it not? Arrest in the form of your curtailment of uh, your personal liberty. No, delay. Well, that was no. That, that, that was can, reason. No. I can it not involve? I don't know. It may have to be examined. One day, Supreme Court will say that also. <laughs> <laughs> no, not that. That is the reason your brother Samrajul has said. The because it is an option. It is may. It is not shall. Yes, yes. So your uh, your option is available when the option is exercised. This also can be one of the grounds for adding more compensation, claiming more compensation. Yes. But that is what Supreme Court going by the Supreme Court, you cannot, is it not? Going by the Supreme Court, no, no, no. no. What they say there is suppose you ah. exercise your remedy here, court yes. dismiss it. Thereafter, for the same cause, you cannot go for a suit. Yes, yes. yes. If you, you cannot go for a suit, that's so it is an option given. Okay. Either you can move the same court, or you can reserve it for a regular suit. Regular, or regular. regular. That is what uh, I understood from the decision. Yes. Sir, subsection two bars the suit, sir. Subsection two says like this: An order determining any such application shall bar any suit for compensation in respect of such arrest attachment or injunction. That is not. It is under ninety-five. Yes. Suppose the party doesn't invoke ninety-five. Yes, yes. And he goes on with another suit instead of invoking 95. So the, that that will be always always advisable. <laughs> yes. For, for no. the party, it will always be advisable to file a regular suit. Even section. Yes. Unless, unless, because you must have the capacity to pay the court fee for the compensation claim. That's all. Yes. Thank you, sir. So uh, before we conclude, we I think uh, Sri K V J Rao has put his hand up. Please, sir, can you make it first? Yeah. I am. I am happy to be here in the August company of such uh, highly placed people. Since you mentioned Section 66A, I am one of the famous arrestees of the Air India who was arrested under 66A. And Shreya Singhal was the daughter of a retainer lawyer in London, in Delhi, and she filed the writ on our behalf, the PIL on our behalf. Wonderful. The police inspector has forged all the posts on Facebook. He forged a remand note from Section 67 to 67A in the court because the magistrate said these are all bailable sections. How am I going to put them and uh, give you police custody? Later on, he they we were arrested for insult to national order. That also was dropped because he said we didn't insult, we didn't touch the flag at all. So he has been forging so many things to get us arrested. 
is there he picked us up at 1:30 in the night with 15 stun gun toting policemen as though we were terrorist flagrant and blatant and then we went we were taken to the police station and right through is telling me you apologize to the politicians and we'll we'll let you go because at that time air india's uh, frauds were coming out the cag report we were discussing the cag report on facebook amongst our colleagues see the now he has forged it like you said it is barred by 195 because the forgery took place before he put that document in court but then if we go to the institute of chartered accountants versus vimal kumar surana in that one portion says that even if he's done that so that means a person who's done the forgery before and used that document in court is going to be protected for the rest of his life and the court said we cannot permit that to happen so we can use women institute of chartered accountants versus vimal kumar surana on the 195 uh, no, case but 195 only party in person to fight my own cases okay 195 only says court will not be the complainant that's all yeah 195 can... court will not be the complainant uh, you are right to pursue is not barred yes yeah exactly filing so a, so filing, a we... filing a private complaint on uh, uh, police case for yes, forgery yes. will not be taken away on account of that not not yes, uh, we have, uh, we have we are process that sir. we are in the process of that and i thank you very much is really enlightening to hear all of you and i am really thankful sir thank you thank you thank you for sharing your experience also sir that was uh, something i mean we all can understand the agony uh, you would have gone through and uh, 11 days sir 11, 11 days my, in police custody it is thanks to a session court judge who said how can somebody who has written something on post per, facebook uh, uh, two posts on facebook you putting him in incarceration for 11 days murderers come out in 48 hours that is the observation of the honorable judge of the session court sir and that's how we got bail the politicians had we made pre- plans for us to be in jail for practically one year we were to be moved to atharo jail and never get bail so we were fortunate to have some good judicial officer in fact they they said that they want to search my house for uh, uh, bombs and guns whereas no arms act uh, sections were even put in the fir <laughs> the complaint was one year old by a politician in the hands of an unscrupulous in the hands of an unscrupulous police officer i i'm fly, i was flying for air india my passport was impounded so that i couldn't go to work we had to go back to the high court to get our passports released there was no court order to impound our passports we went my family went through a harrowing experience sir, just because exchanging uh, uh, notes on cag report on the facebook very mm. good great and i thank the media at that point of time because they took it up very vigorously then they gave us an a platform to come out and say exactly what we had done on facebook and what we had not done on facebook thank you sir thank you for sharing that and uh, murthy sir you wanted to add something no no sir no sir okay over to you prem so that is a really wonderful session we got a lot of learning and with regard to that uh, uh we were speaking about that uh, some state police acts we should uh, mention a different limitation period and uh, just ramakrishna was saying about a kerala decision that decision also it's gone even prior, uh, even the supreme court judgment of 1994 The White Northern Judgment, 99 A R 1994 Supreme Court, one double seven one. Then you have Bakshi Singh Brass case of 1988 A R 1988 Supreme Court 257. And this Kerala decision that stands reversed in the Division Bench of Kerala High Court itself. That is 2000 Supreme Court. That, I think it is Pathuma or something. Justice Shankar Subban and Shivarajan. I don't remember the citation. It was not Supreme Court. You cited Supreme Court. Supreme Court was uh, the other thing. This Kerala, so Kerala, Kerala. Out by Department of Kerala during 2000 in Pathuma's case. I think it was 2000 Volume Two case. I don't uh, remember the base. Pathuma was a uh, state. That was uh, Justice uh, Shankar Subban and Shivarajan. The other was the Supreme Court judgments. Two Supreme Court judgments. One is White Nadan and the other is is uh, Bakshi Singh Bra. It was a wonderful class. We got a lot of learning. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sir, it it has been when, long, sir. Please. When you pen, mentioned Pathuma, I am reminded of a of an argument by a lawyer and a response by the judge. Pathuma, the wife of your owner. What? <laughs> <laughs> That is because every now and then we put your lordship or your owner in between at inappropriate places. So the sentence, if taken together, would mean as if. Pathuma, the wife of your owner. <laughs> sir. 
what can i say the session 94th session which lasted till 610 that itself shows the interest the way in which you presented and uh, the way in which the interaction was also and moreover the subject itself sir. yes the subject thank you yes. uh, uh, so we are deeply uh, indebted to ram kumar sir for suggesting the subject and yes. you sir for that wonderful presentation today uh, and justice murthy sir justice avashan sir and all of you wonderful persons especially sri avj rao sir for uh, narrating that harrowing experience so that we we'll have a personal touch also to i mean uh, the discussions uh, we are having not just from the abstract plane but we could understand that these issues are to be dealt with legally by all the stakeholders not just lawyers not just judges but everybody has to take care of that so till we meet again 330 once again thank you very much for this wonderful session thank you thank you so much sir i'll take your leave thank you thank you sir for being till 610 thank you very much